My Sims 4 is heavily modded. It is Mine disgusting. too. <laughs> Do you have like <laughs> and all that? I do. Okay, me too. <laughs> Daniel, please cut that part out. My mother listens to this. <laughs> Being dead serious. Hello and welcome to the Art of Costume Blogcast. I'm Spencer Williams. And I'm Elizabeth Joy Glass. Elizabeth. It's our one year anniversary. It's our one year anniversary, and we brought some friends to celebrate. Oh my gosh, Daniel White and Chloe White are in the house. What's up? Woo-hoo. Hello. <laughs> well, welcome to our birthday party. I know. It's been one whole year. Wait, I thought this was my birthday party. <laughs> no, that was last week. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no more dinos? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> That's over, Chloe. Okay. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it's been a whole year. Do you remember when we all got together and we're kind of talking about this like over a year ago? I do. It kind of just seemed a little crazy. That was back when you guys first recorded Cruella and Captain Captain America. America. (laughs) And Elizabeth and I thought we could edit it ourselves. We gave it a fair shot. (laughs) You did, you did. We tried. (laughs) The results were rough. You needed a professional touch. (laughs) And we also went to Chloe and we're like, help us. We need art. (laughs) Yeah. Spencer was a horrible client. Well, I'm sure he was. Just kidding. (laughs) Well, I made the art of costume logo a long time ago. Yeah. Right. It was probably like two or three years ago. I remember you came to me. Right when the pandemic started, actually. Yeah, but it was super fun because it was like you already had kind of like an idea of what you wanted, but also like kind of let me just go with it. So, yeah, it was fun to adapt it for the podcast. It's definitely like the coolest logo of all time. I'll definitely die by that. I mean, if I do say so myself. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Elizabeth, it's now been a year. What has been your favorite episode? If you had to pick one or two. Oh my gosh, that's a really stressful question, Spencer. I know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I really like our Crimson Peak episode. Mm. That was a really fun one. A lot of our our spooky season ones were fun. Yeah, I love every episode that has to do with anything scary, including Twilight. I still consider that a horror film, right, <laughs> Chloe? Uh, yeah. I I mean, maybe it's biased, but uh, I thought the guests on that were hilarious so uh absolutely absolutely i've gotten rave reviews from family members that listen to it just saying they were living it up funniest episode on the art of costume broadcast <laughs> twilight we're gonna have yeah. to do a new moon in the new year or something <laughs> i think so oh don't worry i already have plans give the fans what they want i'm already thinking about season season three <laughs> Daniel, what's been your favorite episode since you do listen to all of them, even if that's <laughs> against your will? <laughs> I'm biased. I actually have two, if I'm being honest. Ooh. One is the one I was on for Galaxy Quest. Of course. Yes, of course. Yes. We need your help. <laughs> <laughs> one, because I got to be on it. But two, because I got to see like what you guys do. Mm hmm. So, like, all the research stuff was pretty fun to actually be a part of. Ooh. And then my second one is actually the Alien episode. Oh, well. Oh, that is a good one. That is a good one. There were so many things that I knew nothing about, (laughs) having watched the movie, like, 20 times already. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) not to be biased against that one, too, but I love that episode. (laughs) Yeah. Chock full of details on that one. (laughs) I love Elizabeth's rant in that episode. <laughs> oh, yeah. That is, that's one of my better rants. That's Work. one of my better rants. I love Elizabeth's rant. We need to do a reel of just Elizabeth rants. Um, uh, I'm on it. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> my favorite episode, I think, if I had to pick just one, was either the Dune episode, because, I mean, I just love that movie so much, and Elizabeth really opened my eyes to, like, this whole new sci-fi world I'm enjoying, 
Yeah, you even got the book. Yeah, I got the book. I haven't read it in a couple weeks. Yeah, how's weeks. it going with that? It's uh yeah, it's uh coming along very slowly, but it's it's <laughs> coming along. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved just some of her interviews, like the, what we do in the shadows interview really was like, that was like a big moment for me. Cause I love that show, love the costume designer. So that was really fun to share that with everyone on the podcast. All of our interviews have been really stellar. I'm like so happy with how all of those have come out. Right. I think we're going to have to do like a space jam part two one day just for funsies <laughs> just for funsies <laughs> to give it the justice it deserves <laughs> yes yes i was gonna say one of my other favorite episodes was i remember when you first started out you interviewed the costume designer from mayor of east town and i had uh, just watched that show and i loved it so much it was like so interesting to hear her I, speak on it so I love that one too. Megan Casperlick became like a good friend of the podcast after that and came back and did Moon Knight with us. And yes. I'm sure she'll be back for whatever she's doing next. Also, <laughs> I love those. <laughs> she, she is amazing. She's amazing. Uh, I This has been so much fun. And we just have like a whole other year or five or ten more years of just so many more episodes coming. Obviously, film and TV never stops. And so those amazing costume design, I feel like it's getting better and better. So I just think that we should just take a moment and cheers to one year and all the other great memories that we'll have together as we, I don't know, I'm ranting now, to the future. <laughs> You're going to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all so much yeah. for listening, too. We couldn't do it without all of you, all of your support on Patreon, social media, TikTok, all of that. So cheers to you and the future. Yes. Cheers to the future. Woo-hoo. Nice. <laughs> Love that VFX. <laughs> I'm actually drinking. That's not totally a podcast sound. Yeah, yeah, no. Me and Spencer, we got booze. <laughs> uh, everybody, thank you for one year, and we hope you enjoy this week's episode of Mad Max Fury Road. <laughs> Please be sure to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, too. I think they just recently did that now. So, yeah. please. It helps the show. <laughs> please. <laughs> Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Daniel, for joining us for our birthday party. We love you both very much. And I hope you all enjoy the show. Bye. Bye. Hi, this is Dan, audio engineer of the Blogcast, here to let you know that if you wanted to support the show, you can head over to theartofcostume.com slash podstore. There you can buy some awesome Tee Public merch with the Blogcast logo. We have shirts, sweaters, coffee mugs, stickers, and of course, a baby onesie. Thank you for all of your support. Blogcast. I'm Lisa Joy Glass. And I am Warrior Imperator Spencer Williams. That was a mouthful. <laughs> that was a mouthful. Spencer, how are you? How you doing? I'm doing okay. How the hell are you, Elizabeth? I am fine. It's our anniversary episode, so I'm oh more my than gosh, fine. That is, it is our anniversary <laughs> episode. Uh, in that case, I'm actually fantastic now that you reminded me of that. Because I'm like, yes, <laughs> we did it. <laughs> We did it. It's been a whole year. I mean, we just celebrated with Daniel and Chloe, but, you know, yeah, I'm just yeah. so happy to be here. Um, I do have some bad news, though, Elizabeth. What? I might have gotten into a really bad habit that I'm afraid to share with you. Hey. I started playing The Sims again. I was playing The Sims last night. <laughs> <laughs> it's so addicting. It's taking my life over again. I uh. just can't put it down.
I know that and Animal Crossing really have my attention currently. That's one of the reasons I was late for our recording. (laughs) I I was watching because now I'm obsessed with the new Star Trek shows. So I was watching Star Trek Discovery and playing Animal Crossing. (laughs) And then I was like, oh, I have like 30 minutes to get ready. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I started getting ready 30 minutes before too. And that's kind of my thing. I should really start getting ready earlier. But yeah, I just... I like I'll be at work or we'll be working on podcast stuff. And I'm just like, I wish I was playing The Sims right now. I wonder how my Sims are doing. Right? I want to play The Sims. Right? And then I spend hours building stuff, creating characters, and then I get too exhausted and I don't even play. And I'll get through this phase. It's coming. I feel it. Yeah. I'm like wondering when they're going to make a new Sims. Because I feel like this Sims is going for a, like a long time. Yeah, I don't know. They're still cranking out expansion packs. Yeah. Because this is, they're what, on Sims 4, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like Sims 4. However, I miss, like, there was a lot more options to, like, modify stuff in the previous versions, at Mm. least in 3, which is the only one, the only other one I owned and played extensively. So, like, I kind of want to get back to that. My Sims 4 is heavily modded. Mine too. Do you have like (laughs) and all that? I do. Okay, me too. (laughs) Daniel, please cut that part out. My mother listens to this. I'm being dead serious. Uh, anyway, aside from my Sims and Animal Crossing obsession, I I really just got back into Star Trek, like, more than ever before. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. I'm so glad. Um, like, I wasn't expecting it. And then, yeah, I guess it'll be out by the time this episode comes. I uh, did an interview with the Star Trek Strange New Worlds with costume designer Bernadette Croft. So I had to watch Strange New Worlds, which is still like it's a it's a weekly series. So it's still the first season still ongoing. Um, but it hooked me. And then it was like, oh, this is a because sp- I felt like I was missing something. And it was like, oh, this is a spinoff of Star Trek Discovery. And I was like, well, now I got to go watch Star Trek Discovery. And like oh, nice. Michelle Yeoh's in it, like uh. Doug Jones, all these amazing people I know, like already know. And I'm like... Well, now I have to watch four seasons of this. What am I going to (laughs) do? That's so perfect. I just love how, you know, Elizabeth and I do a lot of these interviews for the blog and podcasts. And like sometimes you'll get requests and there'll be like shows you've never heard of. And sometimes you'd be hesitant, but then you get into it and you like absolutely love it. Yeah. For example, I just binged in 40 hours, two seasons of Hacks. And it's like my new favorite show. I can't wait to like talk to the costume designer about it it's so good i'm obsessed with it i am gonna i'm gonna have to watch that one too because it it looked it looked interesting when you said we we got that request i was like huh i wonder what this is about because there's a million two shows now right i'm like i'm kind of glad i heard because of their financial issues netflix has like cut a bunch of productions Mm -hmm. and i'm like low-key relieved because i like i can only watch so many shows at one time (laughs) Elizabeth's like, it's enough. I'm done. Yeah. No, no, no. I was talking about this with my brother because we were talking about Netflix and their current struggles, which understandable. And, you know, and I was like, you know, they really need to stick to the they're like really high budget shows. Yeah. They need to stick to like the Stranger Things, the Witchers, the Bridgertons, the Bridgertons. Like, stick to those. And then they're really, like, low-budget, cheesy Christmas movies and documentaries. (laughs) You said, don't you dare touch the Christmas movies, though. (laughs) They make equal to or worse than Hallmark Christmas movies. And I am here for it. Because they're filled with, like, B-list actors. Yeah. So it's, like, it's people you recognize, but that aren't, like, super famous. And it's hilarious. I'll watch them as long as they use the holiday model, um, because that was a good one. Right, right. Well, speaking of the holidays, we have a crazy film to get into. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Like, (laughs) everybody, this week, 
In honor of our one year anniversary, we watched the Academy Award winner for costume design, Mad Max Fury Road. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was kidding. This had nothing to do with the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> I questioned that statement, and I was like, "Well, maybe he'll he'll like bring it around." And then I was like, "He's not bringing that around." <laughs> no, <laughs> this movie is absolute batshit crazy. It is. It, it really is. And because I was talking about it with my brother, because this won a ton of Academy Awards. Yeah, but it did not win Best Picture. Mm-hmm. And okay. Okay. I feel like we should have our own awards someday. <laughs> no, I agree. Because it won like best in a photography, like all it won like a bunch of technical achievements. And, but it did, it lost to some, the globe, I think. Mm. Are you looking yep. it up? Yeah, I'm looking it up. I think it's like either the globe or the big short, which are very similar movies. So I, mm. It won to a film. I mean, it lost a film called Spotlight, which I yeah. don't Wait, remember. Wait, was it even nominated for Best Picture? It looks like it was. Yeah, it was. It was okay. The Big Short, Bridge of Spies, Brooklyn, Mad Max Free Road, The Martian, The Revenant, Room, and Spotlight. Okay. I don't remember any of this, honestly. <laughs> Neither do I. However, <laughs> we were looking at like all the Academy Awards at one, and I was like, and yet it lost to Spotlight, which, excellent movie. Of what I, I haven't watched the whole thing. I've seen a little bit of it. Excellent movie. Nothing wrong with it. But it should be whoever by the end of the night has the most Academy <laughs> Awards <laughs> in all of its other technical achievements should be winning Best Picture. Right. <laughs> if you've been winning all night long, you should wrap the night up with just one final award. Yeah. Like, you should take best picture. <laughs> like, I'm like, we found the flaw in the system. <laughs> well, shocking to no one, though, Jenny Bevan walked away with an Oscar Award win that year. Yes. We started this podcast. Our first episode was Corella, which she just won an Oscar for that. So it made 100% sense that we did our anniversary episode with another Jenny Bevan Oscar win. Take it away, Elizabeth. Absolutely. Spencer, before I take it away, do you want to start us with a summary? Oh, yeah. I'll take it back away. I'll take <laughs> it away from you taking it away. <laughs> Years after the collapse of civilization, the tyrannical Immortan Joe enslaves apocalypse survivors inside the desert fortress, the Citadel. When a warrior Imperator Furiosa leads the despot's five wives in a daring escape, she forges an alliance with Max, a loner and former captive. Fortified in a massive armored truck, the war rig, they try to outrun a ruthless warlord and his henchmen in a deadly high-speed chase through the wasteland. And that is Mad Max Fury Road. That is Mad Max Fury Road. If you have not seen it, watch it at your own discretion. <laughs> <laughs> Like, there were some parts, like, this whole movie should just have a trigger warning. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> like, <laughs> I was, I, I haven't seen this movie since, like, the first time, and I couldn't remember. I was like, oh, man, I remember liking that movie. I remember why I haven't seen it then, because it's just, like, nonstop anxiety for me the yes, entire movie. <laughs> yes, and, like, I'm pretty sure it has an R rating, so. It has to. <laughs> like, take, take that at its full, fullest <laughs> <laughs> warning as to whether or not you should watch this and then whether or not you decide to watch Mad Max Fury Road come with me behind the wardrobe we have director George Miller and costume designer Jenny Bevan as previously stated her notable works are A Room with a View for which she won her first Oscar Howard's End another Oscar nomination the 1995 Sense and Sensibility Oscar nomination Ever After a Cinderella Story, which we did a very fun episode on. Yeah. 1999's Anna and the King, another Oscar nomination. Gosford Park, another Oscar nomination, which I said this before. We need to do an episode on it because I have no idea what that movie is, but it always comes out as a notable work of hers. Okay. <laughs> so I feel like we just need to... To see what this is about. Daniel, write that down. Write that down, Daniel. <laughs> Alexander, Sherlock Holmes, and its sequel, A Game of Shadows, The King's Speech, Oscar nomination, The Nutcracker and the Four Realms, and 
Lastly, but certainly not least, Cruella, for which she won this year's Oscar. And just so you you know, Elizabeth, she's currently working on, I think it's a prequel, Furiosa. So she's working on the next Mad Max film prequel sequel. That is exciting because I want to understand Furiosa. Yeah. Because I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I find that exciting. But it was really interesting. And uh, there weren't a ton of interviews she did for this movie. She did a couple really good ones. But I don't know. There was a whole controversy about what she wore to the Oscars. And I feel like that kind of overshadowed her actual win. And there there were like, shockingly, not a ton of articles about this or interviews with her. So hmm, interesting. But in her Vanity Fair article, the interviewer asked her like who she designs costumes for. And she said to them, I've never been asked that before. I think I do it for the director and for the film. I'm a storyteller with clothes. And I just try and do the best job to support the actor for the director and the film. I don't think of the audience, which I'm like, that's very true. Like you are doing as a costume designer, you're doing what the director wants. So that makes a lot of sense. It's like, no, like you can't really think about what the audience is going to take from this. You just got to make sure the um the director's vision it comes across yeah i mean that that quote could be taken in a lot of different ways it's like on one hand you're like yeah you're creating this for the director mm -hmm. i think most importantly like the film and the story like yeah you're staying true to the story and just really bringing it to life but then on the other hand i would think like oh but i'm also thinking of the audience perspective and just like what they take away from the costumes, not really like how they'll perceive it or if they'll like it or, or hate it, but like how the costumes make them feel. Yeah. I don't know. It's an interesting quote that I'm going to be pondering for the rest of the it day. It was a very interesting <laughs> quote, um, which and I just thought it, I thought it was funny because like one of the student films I worked on. I ended up just being like, so long as my director is happy, like <laughs> the costumes are what they are. <laughs> I, so I, so you I think I just fully understood saying. what she was saying. Um, <laughs> but she, in all of these interviews, she has a lot of questions about this being, you know, like a futuristic film. Cause she's very known for her period work, particularly like a Jane Austen um, look that she was, exclusively known for up to this point like she was known for her period pieces she said to deadline about doing you know a futuristic film she said i've always thought i'd love the idea of doing something futuristic space age and i love the deep pass as well but this is almost the perfect vehicle because it's such an extraordinary vision out of george's head and i'll say george has a very strong ideas and he's worked from this graphic novel with Brenda McCarthy. And it was still a real opportunity to do something completely off the wall. It was particularly brilliant opportunity for someone like me who was looking for a new route, a new world, really. So she was like, yeah, this is nothing like I, what I've ever done before. And like, I'm here for it. I want to do something new and special. And it's really a special because it's a whole like it's a whole world they're creating. And she also said with when the interviewer with Deadline brought this up that like, hey, you're like creating a whole new world. She said, you rightly say that with each film, you're creating a new world. And this was simply a very different world. And by doing that in Nambia with a local crew of a lot of Nambians, a lot of diverse diversity heavens. They were all Nambians. They're all black and very talented organic leather makers. And what you have, I think it's our costumes, that organic look. We would have really struggled to do in England or Australia where you just have more film savvy makers, but you wouldn't have got some of the weird and wonderful things. So she's like, yeah, I'm making this new world. And she's like mm. a very big part of that because... Mad Max Fury Road has a very unique look. And she was like, it was the local Nambians where they filmed. It, she was like, it was their artisans and their craftsmen and their like unique look at the world. 
that made this film what it was, that made it such a unique world. And I love how she just like, you know, gave all the credit to them because she was like, we would not have gotten this done in a more traditional setting. Yeah, she's like, the people in England and Australia weren't ready to do Mad Max Fury Road. And, I mean, you could really see, like, that local artisan, all the pieces in this film just felt really unique. And nothing was the same, you know, in this film. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, she was asked about kind of, like, the prep period for this in an article with Vanity Fair. She said, this was an unusual one. Absolutely, each project is its own thing. On the King's speech, I had five weeks from getting the job to the first day of shooting. This, we made everything. And in fact, we had all this stuff they'd made previously. But even more importantly, we had all the junk they collected. So (laughs) apparently, I, I wish... I should have done a little bit more research on, like, the Mad Max films in general. Because first things first, had no idea there were three Mad Max films. Did not previously. Oh, uh, I think there's four now, actually. This is I the think four, this is but a But previous to this yeah. film. Oh, right, 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 right. Um, there's, yeah, there's three, three, which I had no idea. I thought there was, like, one, maybe two. I've never seen them. I don't know. Oh my gosh, Mad Max Beyond the Thunderdome with <laughs> Tina Turner. Ooh, that's a good one. I love that I, film. I will have to find them. There's, I think Mad Max Road Warrior is on HBO. Yeah. I've never seen Road Warrior, but I've seen the first two. I'll have to find them and watch them. But apparently, is, were all the previous ones filmed in Australia? Um, I don't know for sure, but I would say that's a safe bet, though. Okay. They all kind of have, like, the same landscape, so I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. Because, like, she was, like, apparently the production, I guess, company, whoever owns Mad Max, has just been, like, collecting junk to use in Mad Max films. <laughs> They're like, we're the going to need this someday. <laughs> she said she got from Australia about 200 boxes of junk. <laughs> Oh, uh, shit. There were like goggles, bits of ammunition, car parts, just stuff. <laughs> she, there was vellum they used to make masks. She's like, just all this stuff, just stuff, junk. Australia's like, yo, Jenny, we got something for you. We've been yeah. saving 200 boxes of garbage for you. <laughs> she was like, thanks. <laughs> thanks. I'll just create an Oscar award winning wardrobe with that. <laughs> Thank you. (laughs) And with that, we have our Behind the Wardrobe facts, and we need to jump into this, Spencer. Yeah, grab your steering wheels from your pile of extra steering wheels, and we have quite some road to cover, so... We do, we do. Rev up your engines. (laughs) Rev up your engines, try and grab some water, and we'll be right back. Hello, Blogcast listeners. It's Elizabeth Joy Glass, co-host and producer of the Art of Costume Blogcast. Thank you so much for listening. We appreciate all your support. If you wanted to continue your support, you can now become one of our costume mavens when you become our patron at patreon.com slash the art of costume. There we post unheard bloopers, highlights, and you can even catch our monthly bonus episodes for patrons only. Make sure to check out the description for a link to our Patreon. Are you ready to hit the road with our good old pals, Max and Furiosa? I guess so. I guess nobody has much of a choice. Um, I guess so. When we start out the movie, Max is enslaved by a group of scavengers from the Citadel led by the Immortan Joe. We have a scruffy looking Mad Max played by Tom Hardy. (laughs) Bro, he looked real (laughs) scruffy. He looked so scruffy. And I was confused because I was like, I've seen pictures from this movie and he does not look like this. 
So I thought this was a different character at first. Yeah, I was confused at first. I forgot about it. Um, but like even the thing that's so impressive about this film, and I've I've taught costume design workshops before, and I always talk about um, like aging and dying. And this film is like the top of the top, the creme de la creme of like aging and dying. Just it's really impressive to just look at all the garments and costumes in this film and see how they age all their costumes. It's so brilliant. It's just such a harsh environment and it takes a toll on every single costume. And that's what's so artistic. And that's why she won the award was her use of aging on all of her costumes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially this first one. It's so dirty and disgusting. And it's falling apart. I mean, it looks yeah. like he's been living in that busted up car since the world ended. Because he has been living in that busted up car since the world ended. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we get to the Citadel and meet just a slew of concerning characters. <laughs> 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 this is all very concerning and upsetting. <laughs> We've got the human mechanic, all those poor children with just white body paint and eye makeup. His like guards that have like the shaved heads with the black makeup. I'm just like, no wonder all these poor people like follow him. This is terrifying. There's so much happening. I don't even want to talk about the one scene where we saw the women who were producing yeah. milk. <laughs> no. I purposefully <laughs> left that out because I was like, we don't need to talk about this. A, you can barely see them in this film. And B, no thank you. Disgusting. <laughs> also disgusting, uh, we have the important Joe played by Hugh Keys Burn. This costume is out of this world. It is some of the craziest shit I've ever seen. It's crazy. The, like, this is crazy. And I love because the first thing you see is him being dressed. Because clearly he's like a kind of like, he's an extremely like out of shape, sickly, like old guy. Yeah. Like he is. But then they put this like clear body armor on him that has like molded muscles this terrifying like mask and it's just like ew like <laughs> you're yeah. scary he looks like a villain out of an anime yeah I, it's it's very scary and it it really holds true to like the mad max films in the past i mean this is kind of a step up but they've always had like these kind of like creepy looking characters this one really takes the cake for me I mean, I don't want to say this is my favorite costume, but it might be, even though I can't stand his character. He's just so aggressive to look at. Yeah. But the costume is so detailed and so interesting. Yes. Everything about it is just like creepy and haunting, but also like you could tell it's like really thrown together and holding this man alive and makes him look so like, like you said, like a... I don't know, a hero to these people, even yeah. though he's not and probably like sickly and just wants to go to bed. Yes. Yeah. No, because he has like all the medals on, which clearly have been scavenged by his sons or I was confused by who was and was not related to this man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and to, like all the medals and just like th this clear body armor is so aggressively scary. Like, because yeah. they're very, they don't use a lot of armor in this, but clearly he needs it. So he's <laughs> like, I don't want to look like I'm wearing armor, but I got to have this armor. So let's do this like molded body suit yeah. and get, get on with our day. <laughs> it looks like it's barely holding him together. I think it is. I think it is. Um, I did appreciate the mask though, because I'm like, yes, we're in a desert I get the mask. I'm like, I would want one too. <laughs> yes. Yes. Because allergies. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Ugh. I'm dealing with that right now. And I'm like, I don't, I have past few days. I'm like, am I sick or is this allergy? <laughs> this is the first podcast episode in weeks where I actually don't feel like I'm sick. So I know. that's what, that's why I had tea. I thought about getting something a little funner. And then I was like some tea with some locally sourced honey. Oh, my that's brother. so nice. Yeah, we have this um, 
like private airport basically Ooh. by my house and they they run like weird events out of it like every now and then there's like a hot balloon fair okay. and then in the last couple of years on the same property has popped up like a glass blower studio and they make like ornaments and stuff and then uh most recently like a honey farmer that's so nice yeah, my brother came home. He was like, yeah, I just stopped at the honey farm on the way home and got some honey. I was like, okay. <laughs> so lovely. I'm drinking a mimosa with locally sourced oranges. Ooh, got those good California oranges? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> locally sourced from your grocery store? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, something that's not so great or locally sourced, um, <laughs> any of the people in this <laughs> movie, or gasoline or gasoline <laughs> uh we are introduced to furioso who instead of getting gas for the community changes the plans and forces the immortan joe to send out his people to get her and what she has taken from him oh my gosh these people became so scared like even scarier yeah i am very I find a blood bag situation very upsetting. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> I just. Yes. I don't really understand it and I don't want to understand it. And I'm like, they clearly have like some level of like technology because they like, as part of like capturing him, they like tattoo on his back. Like he's a universal donor, like all this like medical, I guess, information yeah. about him. And then they're just like, oh, yeah, you need blood, universal donor. <laughs> like, it was... Why can't we just get bags of blood? I don't understand. Right? <laughs> I right. don't even like talking about um, this. It's making me feel nauseous. <laughs> no. But clearly, all of the, all these young men are insane and sick. Like, there's so much radiation sickness yeah. in this movie. I was starting to feel ill just seeing it <laughs> on the screen. Uh, one of my favorite costumes, though, is Max's haircut, which, by the way, I sh I would think Max should actually thank everyone for the haircut because he looks a lot better. He looks significantly better, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even realize it was Tom Hardy until he got the har the haircut. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, it's Tom Hardy. Um, That, like, metal mask he wears, this is a costume point. It, it gives me so much anxiety. It's just like, you know how uncomfortable it is. You could tell it's just so tight and it would make me panic I, yeah. I feel panicky just talking about it and it's like i love how like because it's like this weird like trident piece yeah and i love how like the outer spikes of it go like right up to his like pupils and i'm like like the wrong move and he's just like he's blind like yeah. uh. horrifying and then the fact that all, what, what do they call them war boys yeah all the war boys just Black pants, scarf, makeup. Like, it's creepy. It's very creepy. <laughs> it's very creepy. But creepiest of all, we have Nicholas Holt as Nux. Until I saw this film <laughs> for years. For years. I thought this was Eddie Redmayne. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw your note and started busting up. <laughs> yeah, that's, no, that's Peter the Great. <laughs> I... Cause like I I had seen like I had seen the trailer and I'd seen like little clips from it here and there. Cause how can you not? Yeah. Always thought it was Eddie Redmayne <laughs> until I was physically watching the movie and was like, "That's Nicholas Holt." Yeah. And I was like, "You know like, what? That's fair, Elizabeth. That's yeah. fair." Because you always see this him in the car, and I was like, "Huh? I didn't know Nicholas Holt was in this movie." And I was like, "I guess him and Eddie Redmayne are in it." And then I see him in the car and I'm like, wait, Eddie Redmayne's not in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's very fair. Um, but Nicholas Holt as Nux, I mean, it's a crazy character. And his costume, though, is is interesting because he's actually wearing a costume unlike most of the other war boys. Yeah, because he has stolen um, Max's jacket. <laughs> for whatever reason and like all the other war boys he has goggles on and um jenny bevan talked about them a little bit to vanity fair she said not only did this film have to look amazing 
they had to be able to work in it, referring to the costumes. They had to have safety built into it. Everyone had to wear goggles in the end because of the sand. And, you know, racing through the desert, churning up the sand was dangerous. Oh, wow. So I was like, I never thought about that. She, She's like, th- these were not just, oh, they look great as the costume piece. She's like, everybody literally had to have eye protection, which I'm like, that makes complete sense. Would have never thought about it. But yeah, everybody had to protect their eyes from the sand. They were literally in the desert. <laughs> She's like, the desert actually is going to kill them if I don't <laughs> step up the costumes. <laughs> She's like, everybody is losing their eyesight unless we oh, have goggles. No. <laughs> uh, we also have in these first couple of scenes, uh, Furiosa played by Charlize Theron. Such a badass. Such a badass. So like, good. so good. She's got this sick corset with the belt details. I, I love what a lot of the women, especially from the Citadel, wear because it's clearly beautiful, beautiful silk that's <laughs> just been destroyed. <laughs> right. <laughs> Unless you're one of Morton Joe's beautiful wives, but we'll get yes. into that. We will get into that. Um, uh, I love Furiosa's mechanical arm. It yes. Just, it brings me so much joy. And when you actually go to the Academy Museum in Los Angeles, they have her arm on the Yes, yeah, I love that. Because <laughs> I didn't realize that was a part of her costume. I was very familiar with her costume. But for some reason, I'd never noticed her arm. <laughs> um, I don't know why, but I just never did. And yeah. uh, apparently she... Shirley Theron loved this outfit. Um, Jenny Bevan talked about her first fitting with her to Vanity Fair. She said when Charlize came in for her fitting in Nambia, she put one on and said, this feels really great. And it had to be a sort of corset because she had to put this harness on top of it. I went all sort of English and coy and said, oh, well, you know, we've been trying to make it. And she said, take the compliment, compliment, bitch. And George (laughs) literally elevated about a foot in the air. He sort of jumped. She just very, she's just very straight talking. And I just loved it. So I've been taking the compliment, bitch, ever since. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. (laughs) I would have been like, you apologize to Jenny Bevan right away. But she was like, oh, yeah, I guess I should just take the compliment. (laughs) (laughs) I've always wanted to meet Charlize Theron. I just feel like she's probably like the coolest, most badass person you could ever possibly meet. I feel like she is really just like a character in real life. And I just, I want to know. I'm like, what are you like? I imagine she's like Furiosa in real life. That's how I've always yeah. imagined her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. Uh, another interesting part of um, Furiosa's overall look is her makeup. And... Uh, hair and makeup artist for the film, uh, Leslie Vanderwalt, uh, did a couple interviews. She said to Vogue, we got the idea for Furioso's forehead look from a picture I had of a lovely girl in Africa who had wiped clay across her forehead from her eyebrows up. Furiosa probably would have used a bit of grease or oil to get that sheen and Charlize thought for her character, she'd reapply it like war paint. And I'm like, that's just so cool. Because you actually do see her reapply it throughout the film, too. And she's like, okay, it's time. It's time to get <laughs> to get going. Um, it just looks so bad in like a good way. Like yeah. she, looks, she looks scary. And don't mess with her. No, don't mess with her. Also... Um, don't mess with her cargo, the wives of Immortant Joe. Uh, <laughs> when Max is sent out with Nux, who is using him as a blood bag, as we talked about. Um, through the course of the hunt for Furiosa, he escapes the scavengers and finds the women that Furiosa saved. <laughs> Uh, this part makes me crazy (laughs) just all these beautiful models just stop they all look so good i mean zoe kravitz hello yeah like they're each stunningly beautiful but all in like a very different way 
they all have like a very unique look. And I was like, wow, this man is really just trying to get a diverse population of children. <laughs> um, were I they all pregnant or just I a couple of them? I think it was just um, just the two. Rosie Huntington Whiteley's character. Was there more than one? Uh, I know the blonde, one, the blonde, the bleach blonde one. She also says she's pregnant. Oh, which, by the way, that's Abby Lee, who we met for the first time in Lovecraft Country, who played Christina <gasps> Braithwaite. Yeah. That's her? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. She's such I a for- baby in this movie. <laughs> I know. They all are. I mean, Zoe Kravitz <laughs> looks like a baby in she this. She does. She does. Oh, I wasn't expecting I didn't know she was in this f- film. And I was like, wait, that's Zoe Kravitz. I forgot up until I started watching it. This is only my second time seeing it. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, their costumes, though, are all sick. I love them because, of course, they're all, like, dirty. But you could tell, like, at one point they were, like, supposed to be, like, white and elegant. Mm-hmm. But then when they're out in a desert, like, they all, like, kind of, like, blow in the wind, which makes them kind of look like angelic as far as mad max you know like rules go (laughs) yeah they really look like grecian statues which when you see where he kept them makes a lot of sense yeah because it's like the plushest most beautiful part of his his little kingdom and it's like you can tell he was really they were just ornaments for him but i'm also like the like the fact that they're wearing so little so little clothing i'm like that's just like such a tool he used to keep them at the Citadel. Cause it's like, you can't survive in the desert very well wearing that little clothing. Like you're going to get horrible, horrible sunburn and like tired, like just from the sun exposure so quickly. Like it's insane that they ran away in that. Well, I have a feeling they probably never leave. I mean, they were locked behind a vault door. Well, yeah, but like (laughs) keeping them dressed like that would have like given them a reason not to leave. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, there some horrific stuff was happening before this film started. You could totally tell like... (laughs) Absolutely. Like, I don't, if this Furiosa prequel <laughs> has anything to do with what's happening inside a Citadel, I don't want it, honestly. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I don't want to know. It's oh just my gosh. too much. <laughs> the freaking chastity belt the one girl had on. I was like, no, thank you. Yeah. This no, is thank scary. you. I was like, so it's a pretty badass looking piece, though. It like, is... whoever on Jenny's team made it, it looks awesome. Oh, it is actually beautiful, but horrifying (laughs) um however like you said they all look like models and leslie talked to vogue about their look a lot she said we wanted the girls to glow in this dusty dirty filthy world luminous almost like a mirage like people couldn't believe their eyes (laughs) which i'm like yeah that's pretty much uh i mean they literally are models. That's <laughs> they're they're models before they were actresses. So yeah. that's the cool part about it. That's All four, true. five of them were models. So it's pretty awesome. Uh, she also said about their just very simple look. It's always a rule of less is more when you're out there, and they wouldn't have had access to anything. It would have been ludicrous to have them look like beauty queens. Ev- as if they'd found a Sephora somewhere underground, <laughs> which I'm like, they could have very easily done that. Like that sounds tempting, but she talks a lot about how they just like use very light makeup. She also said, like they use dirt a little bit. She was like, we kind of like shaded and highlighted like with dirt, but like in a way that wouldn't be distracting. Right. And I'm like, huh, that's so fascinating. <laughs> um, well, Rosie does look like she did hit up Sephora a little bit, but I'll let that one pass. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's probably the one that was gifted any makeup that was scavenged. <laughs> she was definitely the favorite. You yeah. could tell by the way that the Morton Joe was kind of freaking out, especially when she fell out of the car and got, you know. Elizabeth doesn't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about what happened to her afterwards. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, that's that's fair. Carry on. Oh, my gosh. I thought they were going to show a lot during that scene after she fell out. And I was like, I am not ready for this. And I was like, okay, 
they were as tasteful as they could be in this situation. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, they spared us. Um, but after Max runs into them, he steals uh, the war rig like a jackass. Then is outsmarted by Furiosa, who <laughs> forces him <laughs> to join with her and the women. But Nux, the gas town boys, and bullet farmers soon catch up with them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a lot to say here. Let's start with the bullet farmers. I mean, their costume is super cool, especially the leader played by Richard Carter. Yeah. I mean, it's their bullet farmers, so his armor is made out of bullets. Oh, bullets. I thought his look was so cool. Uh, it's also, super like a cool. little cheesy looking on him. Because just like. This, like, older guy, like, what is he doing out here, like, in the middle of the desert, tracking down these wives? Like, he does look yeah. a little ridiculous with his, like, bullet headpiece. I think that's kind of the point, too, though, because it's, like, at one point, they they called each other brother, like, a Morton Joe and Bullet Farmer. I don't know if they're actually related, but, like, definitely, like, the Bullet Farmers are not as prestige as, like, the people of the Citadel. Yeah. It's almost like they're kind of... The joke, but they're also like necessary. Speaking of jokes, the people eater played by John Howard. <laughs> this costume, I won't lie, I absolutely hate it. <laughs> the the cutout nipples really sends me. <laughs> so when I was watching this, I didn't notice the cutout nipple. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky for you, because I did, and I was not able to sleep last night. <laughs> Until I saw this picture and I was like, excuse me? Why? <laughs> what is know. happening? I Why? Don't know. His nose was bad enough. Yeah. Like clearly he does not have a nose. But why? I don't know. <laughs> Disgusting. It's just, it just adds to the creepiness of the Mad Max universe. This is like peak Mad Max just nonsense. 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 Also going through a lot of nonsense. Poor Nux. <laughs> he, he's just in his dirty, dirty pants. And then all these tattoos on him. I'm like, boy, like, <laughs> what have you been doing to yourself? Um, but more on him later. Uh, after attempting safe passage through the mountains... Max and Furiosa attract more unwanted attention <laughs> um, in the form of these mountain people who I absolutely love their costumes. Yeah, it's super cool. They kind of reminded me of like the Tuscan Raiders of like Star Wars a little bit. A little bit, a little bit. I feel like they look like Buffalo a little bit. <laughs> like they're clear, like the, I can't tell if it's just like a whole headpiece or a headpiece and their hair. Yeah. It's gorgeous. It blends in because it's all like reds and oranges and browns. So they like blend right into the mountains and they look so cool riding after her on their dirt bikes. Yeah, they're like clearly taking like they're making something out of nothing. It's like very put together for a whole bunch of random stuff. But somehow it like still creates like a cohesive shape between what like looks to be like a tribe of some sort. It's very beautiful. Um, yeah, I kind of do see like the buffalo influence, maybe like a goat or something. Like they have little horns. Yeah. They might be devils too, but they kind of like read like mountain animal. Yeah, <laughs> like, a, like you goats know, like those, or something. Like the goats that like stick to the side of a mountain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, in in this post apocalyptic world, I mean. Yeah. Might as well. All right. Uh, with that, though, Spencer, I need a little bit of time to de decompress before we finish this up. How about you? <laughs> yeah, I need another mimosa after the nipple tassels came up again. I just I need to go lay down. OK. All right. Everybody <laughs> go lay down and we'll be right back to finish up Mad Max. <laughs> What's up, costume nerds? This is Spencer, co-host and producer of the Art of Costume Blogcast. I love the simple things in life. Free parking, air conditioning, and a nice comfortable hoodie. If you feel the same way, then I'm here to let you know that if you wanted to support our show, you can head over to theartofcostume.com slash podstore. 
There you can buy awesome Blogcast merch through TeePublic, such as t-shirts, hoodies, coffee mugs, and stickers. We even have a baby onesie for all those baby costume designers out there. To get your merch, head over to theartofcostume.com slash podstore. Thank you for all your support. Suit. I am. Also, one thing before we get back into this, did you catch Max's like low key like growl instead of like talking like the first half of this film? He was just growling every time. The man barely spoke. <laughs> no, but when he did, it's like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, no, is that Tom Hardy? <laughs> I noticed the main character had the least amount of lines of anybody in this film. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, Tom Hardy once in a generation kind of talent <laughs> i still have to see venom i've never seen the venom movies me either oh my gosh do we actually have a film to watch for finer things club i don't know we should watch the venom movies i think they're That'd on so fun. hbo max that Let's will be fun it. what was not fun was <laughs> as our crew is being pursued by through the night <laughs> they lose the splendid Ankhara. AKA the beautiful wife that was super pregnant (laughs) and they are pursued by the bullet farmer and they run into some fantastic swamp people. Nice. These nighttime shots were stunning. They were so beautiful. I mean, it was like art. I mean, this whole film is like essentially like a very artistic cinematic film as much as we are like this film makes me anxious, you know, but like there's some like really impressive shots in this film. I mean, like the the fact that it can make you anxious is a, you know, testament to how well this was produced and shot and like the work because I think it is supposed to make you anxious. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I think that's the point. Um, But we get to see in one of these night scenes, a character who I kind of loved Miss Giddy played by Jennifer Hagen. She was this just beautiful older woman who, who was in charge of the wise before she helped Furioso help them escape. And Leslie, talked about um all miss giddy's tattoos she said we would start by applying the tinsley tattoo transfer the day before and she would sleep in them (laughs) this application in all took a total of six hours damn it also included a wig done beautifully by anita morgan The fact that she had to sleep in them is just bananas. She like, I'm like, talk about being a trooper because she, her entire body is tattooed. Yeah. Like this is like one of those things I want to know, like what's with all the tattoos? This was a movie. This was another one of those kind of movies where I'm like, I felt like I was missing information. They just love the tattoo. I don't know. What else do you do out here? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. But, um, who got like a style upgrade by a just the lighting in the night scenes and his lack of eyesight? The bullet farmer. Yeah, he looks, <laughs> looks so cool. So now. cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talking about an upgrade. Yeah, and it's like literally all they did was remove his helmet and like add that that blindfold over his eyes. And he suddenly looks like a really badass warrior, not like a like a paranoid grandpa. Yeah, he was going out with a bang, literally. Um, it's just the colors are just so stunning. But you could still see like the bullets like all over yeah. him as in like he's still going down as the bullet farmer. You knew exactly who this character was, even if you if he couldn't see, we could see him. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um we also get to see these fantastic swamp people at night. So cool. Wanted an actual scene with them. Because at first I thought they were animals. And I was like, no, these are clearly people on stilts. Yeah. <laughs> That's who they are. They just, they have these fantastic, huge, just like cloaks that 
Like, they're just, they're, like, mossy and, like, ragged. And they're clearly meant to, like, if they lay down in the swamp, to just look like part of the swamp. Um, yeah, you you can't even see the colors, but you just know by looking at it, they're, like, covered in, like, algae or moss or something. And it's just vines and all sorts of crazy stuff, which I love. And you can't even see it. It's just a silhouette. And you just know that that costume is done so perfectly well that the silhouette, you know exactly what it is. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but they kind of get to where they're going. They find Furiosa's original family and the fact that her entire home is destroyed. It is now the green place she has been promising to take these poor girls. <laughs> the green is, place. <laughs> the green place is a swamp now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they missed it. The swamp people were actually their besties. Yeah. And they're like, well, what the fuck do we do now? And Max is like, you could always take the Citadel. That's a green place, too. I love how the wives are like, we're going where? And they're like, oh, to the Citadel. It's like we just spent like two days running away from the citadel why would we go back yeah yeah and i love that's like when he's like grunting a lot like yeah uh uh-huh yeah Yeah. here here we're like what (laughs) oh but we get to meet the what do they call them the many mothers yes who are just all these badass older ladies Except for the Valkyrie played by Megan Gale. She yes. looks badass. You she can tell was that so she's cool. A, she's adapted to this situation and her costume just to me screams like it's not even that dirty almost, you Mm-mm. know, like it's actually kind of put together. It's a strong armor and she's ready to she's ready to fight for her life out here. She's been protecting her people and she'll die doing that. Uh, and that's exactly what she does, unfortunately. But um, <laughs> also our wives all get an upgrade. And I say wives because I can't remember their names because, okay, oh my gosh, this is the thing I was going to talk about earlier that really bothered me because they're like, oh, because this is like a very feminist film. It absolutely is. Right. But they don't take the time to name the women. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're like, it's funny. They're like named on IMDb. <laughs> but, but like, you never hear the their film. names say out loud. <laughs> they're, I, I, I think sometimes they talk about each other. Sometimes, I think. Yeah. But the majority of the time, they're just referred to as the wives. And I'm like, <laughs> can, can we give them actual names, Mr. George Miller? And then their names you came are, this far. Their actual names are like super long, too. Yes. <laughs> yes. But, um, anyways, they're covered anyway. up and they look like comfortable for once. So, like, oh, we have like some actual fabric on and like covering my head and, you know, like protected from the elements. They actually look like covered up and comfortable for once. Yes. And I love the one that has this little romance going on with Nux. She gets this fabulously embroidered piece of fabric to use as like a cloak. Yeah. And that like suits her perfectly. The platinum blonde one, she gets this whole like black waffle knit scarf with like some bones and like a another she's like she's like this witchy woman already and they just like add to her witchiness yeah that's my favorite one you could tell like that fabric is nice that she put over her head absolutely and then zoe kravitz gets this like beautiful like green and gray and like cream ensemble that really just like it looks beautiful on her yeah let's just they all look I wouldn't say happy, but they all just like comfortable. They look comfortable for the first time. If we got, we're going back to the Citadel, but if we got anything out of this, we got some nice blankets and some clothing to cover up for at least a couple days or hours. How they are all not like be red at this point, I don't know. Yeah. However, they're like finally some protection from this stupid sun. We also have to talk about a character, uh, the Doof Warrior, played by Iota. The guitarist character. The guitarist character, which was fabulous. Uh, So cool. I don't know. Something about him is so scary, too. Yeah. I don't know what it is. It's like, like, oh, he's like a rocker out. He's rocking out. He's cool. But then also he's scary because his... 
His whole vibe is just very. I don't, I don't know what. His whole vibe is scary. I don't know how to describe this character, honestly. It's just a lot, but I love it. I love it too. And Jenny Bevan loved it. She talked about this character to Deadline. She said, I was very surprised. My tragedy with that is that underneath that costume is the most fantastic Australian cabaret artist called Iota. And you don't even see his face. He's such an amazing man and a brilliant painter, artist, and musician. And there he is, wearing this ridiculous red onesie and this extraordinary mask. (laughs) (laughs) So she's like, this is such a cool person. And he looks ridiculous. To me, it's like giving like almost kind of like like punk revolution a little bit. I don't know. Like the onesie and the stockings. It's almost like, I don't know, kind of giving me Corella vibes a little bit. In a way, like, I don't know. <laughs> He's giving punk revolution. That's all end that. <laughs> also, in these final scenes, as they're taking the Citadel, we get our Mad Max in his full Mad Max ensemble. Uh, Jenny Bevan also talked to Deadline about um, his character. She said, we were aware of the previous designs. Tom Hardy's costume, the underneath bit of it, is Mel Gibson with a different t-shirt, but everything that went on top was to do with Tom and his feeling about where his Max may have come from. George always said, it's not the fourth, fourth Max. It's another Max. I changed a lot of things and I think we got away from what I would call the look of the road warrior. We went to a, a grittier place, which was great. Yeah, it's like it definitely is reminiscent of the pra- the previous Mad Max films, but is different. It does feel very like leveled up in a way that you know would make sense for Tom Hardy in was yeah. this 2015, 2016. So I get it. it. Like it's it echoes the Mel Gibson, but it's not. Yeah, and I also love it because she talked a little bit in one of the other articles about. Tom Hardy was kind of for his character taking inspiration from a lot of the, you know, like Iraq war veterans Mm -hmm. and like what they were going through mentally and kind of like the look they would have had while in the service. So I'm like, this is very much that like Iraq war veteran inspired look because I'm like, you can actually see that in other film, that inspiration in other films. What I do love those that in, uh, Fury Road, he does have like that shoulder piece though. And that to mm-hmm. me, like, is that's the nod to the previous films. Absolutely. Like, this yeah. is a Max character, but this isn't that Max. This is a different Max, but that shoulder piece says everything. I'm almost like with that whole jacket though, it's almost like at some point, like, he found that same jacket. Right. Like, yeah, he's a different Max. He's a different Mad Max, like, entirely but he was just like oh at some point Mel Gibson's Mad Max just discarded it and he found it (laughs) (laughs) right (laughs) Uh, but with that we come to the end as our ladies take the citadel and release all the water oh thank god I mean it was such a relief that this honestly I was relieved when this film ended it was just yeah two hours of stress and anxiety (laughs) doesn't mean it's a bad film i think this is a superb oh this is an excellent yeah but like you're stressed out the entire time like i could think the movie i am legend great movie me i just want to cry the entire time watching it you know like this is one of those movies where you're like oh when is this over not because it's bad but you're like I need to like go to the bathroom and like chill out for a second, take my inhaler. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. And I was just like, all of like, this does a very good job of implying a lot of the abuse and torture and that's going on like at the Citadel and behind the scenes with the women and like even like the war boys like it's so sinister and it just like makes you kind of sick yeah yeah that's why i'm like i'm nervous because i you know furiosa the i think it's a prequel is coming out but i also read this morning that they're making it sounds like a sequel to fury road oh 
Part of me is very excited, Mm -hmm. but the other part of me is like, no, please. Like, I don't want to know what's happening. (laughs) Right? I was kind of mad because at the end, he just like walks away from them, Max. Yeah. I'm like, Max, what are you doing? I get that you have issues, clearly. Right. (laughs) Stay here. Like, they need your help. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I don't know that they ever intended to make like sequels, but. I mean, Fury Road did incredibly well when it came out. Yeah. I mean, like you said, it basically dominated the Oscars except for Best Picture. Like, Yeah. Hold on. Let's look this up. It was nominated for cinematography. Didn't win. Costume design. Obviously, it won. Yeah. It was nominated for directing. It won film editing. It won makeup and hairstyling. It won production design, sound one sound editing, <laughs> one sound mixing, somehow didn't win visual effects. <laughs> Interesting. Um, or best picture. I'm yeah. like, <laughs> um, excuse gonna, me, members of the Academy. <laughs> we have been talking about starting our own awards one day and just every day that just feels like more and more necessary. So stay tuned. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I'm going to think about this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to think about this. <laughs> the, our supporters have asked for it on Instagram and TikTok. So I'm just saying. Maybe we'll start with a costume based one and then expand. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> with that, Elizabeth, I think it's time to finish with our favorite game. Are you ready to play? What are we playing, Spencer? The one costume to rule them all. Okay, Elizabeth. Um, you start. This is kind of a hard one for me because I'm tempted to pick Furiosa because I actually like that character. <laughs> However, in terms of my favorite costume, unfortunately, I have to say it's a Morton Joe. I mean, I hate the man. He's evil. I hate looking at him. But his costume is sick. And it's just, absolutely it's so recognizable. There's so much detail in it, like the little badges of honor mm-hmm. on his on his chest piece that he clearly like scavenged somewhere. It's a really beautiful costume. I don't love looking at it, but it really creates such an interesting, scary character. And just like hats off to Jenny Bevan because this is just top notch work. Absolutely, I totally agree. Um, he that his. His whole wardrobe is extraordinary. Uh, however, my choice was the guitarist because, <laughs> like, th- his look in particular is so different from anybody else's look in this film. And it's low key iconic. <laughs> like, <laughs> I knew this character. I thought that character would have a bigger <laughs> role right. than just playing guitar. But, like, you know this look and his, like, the wet, like, his physicality in this wardrobe is extraordinary as well. And it, like, kind of expresses everything the Citadel is about, which it's, like, it's it's this weird tribal control, like, of this warlord who, like, uses music and, like, you know, like, mythology to control his people. And I feel like the guitarist kind of symbolizes all of that. Yeah. It's just like, what is this guy's life when he's not playing a guitar on this truck? Yeah. When he's not hanging from scaffolding. (laughs) Like, what does he do when he gets back to the Citadel? I wonder if he's like a local legend or something. I don't know. (laughs) Who knows? Who knows? Oh, but Spencer, 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 are you ready to once again, celebrate america's ass <laughs> <laughs> you know it i am so excited that next week we're continuing our july 4th tradition of watching a captain america film if you all remember our second episode of the podcast was captain america the first avenger this time we're watching captain america the winter soldier because what better way to celebrate the 4th of July, then celebrating with America's ass. Everybody get ready 
Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you liked what you heard, uh, please give us a little five-star text review on Apple Podcast and or Spotify. I uh, would be greatly appreciated. You can also follow us on Instagram at the Art of Costume Pod or on TikTok at the Art of Costume. And if you want to extend your support, we have a Patreon now, Spencer. Yeah, you guys got to listen. We have so many fun episodes that are just for our Patreon subscribers. So come check it out. And everybody, I hope you have a fabulous week free of the desert. Yeah, unless you want to go to Valhalla and then I guess continue with the desert. I don't know. Witness me! (laughs) (laughs) Bye, everyone. Bye. The Art of Costume Blogcast is hosted and produced by Elizabeth Joy Glass and Spencer Williams. Our audio engineering and editing is done by Dan White. Follow us on Instagram at The Art of Costume Pod or visit theartofcostumeblogcast.com for all blogcast updates. If you want to support the show, go to theartofcostume.com slash podstore or you can head over to patreon.com slash theartofcostume for some bonus content. For more costume reviews, deep dives, and interviews, head over to theartofcostume.com, a blog dedicated to highlighting the best in costume design. Oh my gosh, where did I get that quote from? Wiener Sucker 2000. Has he struck again? No, I just was seeing if there's any new comments. Uh, Should we pause our recordings? No, I found it. It's fine. All right. Now I ran out of mimosa. I'll wait till the next break. Oh, well, that sounds like a you problem. <laughs> um, let me make sure I put a break in here while we're at it. Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs>